Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Flint Community Webinar, your community resource every Friday at noon. We're so excited to bring you really trusted, important information. We just finished sending kids back to school. It's heading into fall season. We're also heading into flu and respiratory virus season. So we're going to be talking about a lot of information that's going to be helpful as we think about vaccines and what you need to know about your health. So we've got a really great bunch of people here who are going to talk about that. We've got Joanne Herman from the Genesee County Health Department, who's going to be talking a little bit about that, along with her colleague, Tina Hansen. We've got Dr. Asha Harris, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about what we can expect with COVID-19 vaccine updates. And then a little bit later, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Flint Leverage Points Project, um, projects to understand food in the Flint community, how it's disseminated, how it's resourced. We've got a whole bunch of really great expertise that we're excited to share with you today. Let's start by talking a little bit about vaccines and everything we need to know about our health. And I see we've got Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, you're muted. We've got Joanne and Tina. Okay. Perfect. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Trying to get, I'll share our screen now. No and worries. And our PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so we're going to talk about it from the Genesee County Health Department perspective and what it means for adults. So we're really focusing on adults today and each of you in the room. And my first word of advice is protect yourself and know your status. Um, not all vaccines for adults are recorded in the MICR system, which is our system of record. So if you know you've had a vaccine and it's not reflected, reflected in your profile, work with your provider and others and we can add that into your record. That's especially important if you've went from state to state to state. So our Michigan profile really looks at just Michigan uh, administered vaccines. So um, know, know your status and see what your record shows. As yeah, we're going to talk, go really ahead. Help that, well, I just, that's really helpful information. I wonder if you would tell people what MICR is, right? Like I know what MICR is, but like yes. some people might know what it, what it is or where you can access it or how they yes. know what that is. Yes, so this is our database in the state of Michigan, and odd as it seems, the from state to state to state, we do not have a coordinated record of looking at immunization status. And as mobile as, as people are, especially if you think about people that went to Florida and they might get some of their vaccines down there and then they come back up to Michigan, um, that, that will not be recorded in that system. So that's our Mi Michigan um, registry. Um, we are required, um, providers are required to record that for children in, in a short period of time, but adults, that requirement's not in place. So we'd hope that our providers enter that data into MICR into the database so that we have a complete profile of where we are. Got it. And I learned that lesson because I knew where my profile was. I pulled up my, my MICR results and lo and behold, I had um, vaccines that I had gotten, you know, at one of the health institutions that wasn't recorded. So I would say, know your record. And I'll, in the next slide, I will show you a, a profile of how you can get your MICR. Um, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to also mention why it's really important that we make sure that our immunizations are in MICR as adults. Because if you went to a provider and you weren't really sure yourself of the immunizations you got, the provider pulled up your record and didn't see, you know, a specific immunization, let's say shingles on there. Sure. And he vaccinated, he or she vaccinated you for shingles, but you already had it. You'd be on the hook for that bill. You know, that's something that, you know, I don't think people really look at, but we hear that quite a bit. You know, you can't, the insurance company aren't going to pay for it twice if it's not part of a regular routine scheduled big vaccine. So it, not putting it MICR, it actually puts um, adults at risk of having to pay that bill if not knowing their own status. Plus getting that vaccine twice. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. adult, when we look at adult vaccines, it's really not quick. like you, you have- can't see your screen if you are showing slides. Sorry. <laughs> Pardon that. Can you repeat that? 
if you're showing slides, we can't see them, but we could oh, show no. them if you need us to. Oh, you go get Brad. I, I thought you could see, I'm sharing. Mm. And if we need to, we've yeah. got them in the background and we can. Okay, well, we'll go get, see if we can get some help. So we go in the corner. So, um, and I'll talk in the meantime until the person can come in because it looks like I'm sharing that. Um, but adult vaccines vary by your age. So what a, you know, a 20 year old needs is different than a 65 year old. It changes by medical conditions. So if you've had a recent heart transplant or you have diabetes, um, other medical conditions can impact. And there are other indications such as pregnancy, I'm a healthcare worker, as many of you are on this call. Our needs are different. Um, if you're gonna do travel, especially to some remote parts of the world, uh, military. So by age, we have different um, needs and by our indications and conditions. So um, the bottom line is also, we wanna protect ourselves as protecting you. You wanna protect yourself from preventable diseases. You know, we, we'll be talking more about influenza, pneumonia, shingles, COVID, et cetera, but we want to keep you safe. So you want to protect yourself. And we all, you know, we've been talking about vaccines, reduce the risk of hospitalization and reduce the risk of, um, of death. So it may not, in some cases, it can prevent it in some communities, but something like influenza, it can help, um, it, it won't, may not prevent you from getting the flu, but it can help reduce some of the risks of, of complications that may come about. And we're still not sharing, are we? Oh, no, we see your slides now. Oh, yay. Okay. Your Thank slides. you. Thanks to Brad, who's Thank with Brad. us. So Thank you, Brad. We appreciate you. <laughs> it's not moving ahead now. You have no idea how much we appreciate Brad and yeah. his... All right, we're no stranger to tech difficulties, so no worries. <laughs> so this is so there's a slide. So this is how you and, and I'd be lying if I told you this was an easy process. It's not an easy process to get. So, but you, this is included in your slides, and for today, that is what we have. But you can also reach out to your primary care physicians. There's some um, awesome pharmacies in town that will run your pro profile for you as well. So. Um, we can utilize that. So my advice is know your numbers. Okay. In addition to protecting you, we want to protect Genesee County. We want to protect our families. We want to protect those vulnerable adults that might be living in our home or that you may be visiting. They may be the most vulnerable population and what impacts you with that disease and, and spreading that disease may have a whole different consequence for that population. And just a note, Genesee County um, follows suit very well for both young toddlers, adolescents, and adults. We have some of the lowest vaccine rates in the state of Michigan. So we've got a lot of work to do to protect our Genesee County. On the provider level, on the provider level um, and at the health department, we all have um, processes in place to remind people. We do really good with pediatrics not as good with adults to remind you, although it's hard to miss that it's flu season now and it's time to get your shot, but having reminder programs, um, providers looking at every visit, what every opportunity, I may not be coming in for a well visit, I might not be coming in for my annual exam, I might be coming in for something different and is that an opportunity to either educate them or to have them catch up with any vaccine that they may be missing. So we talk about education, listening, and strongly recommending, um, and we're working on some of that messaging to help our, our physicians in their practice. And it's not just the physicians themselves or the, or the provider, but it's a whole team approach. It's that front end scheduling, it is that MA in the office, it's that whole role that people can take on as providers. And I would be remiss if I didn't remind our providers that we want to report reportable conditions and the phone number so that we can keep our community healthy and we can stay abreast for what might be happening in our community. Um, access to adult vaccines. Obviously the health department is one of those places that you can get uh, immunization services. 
as well as we're doing a huge amount of, over the last month and the month ahead and the month after that of outlying clinics. Um, for adults, we're going to senior centers, we're going to different school districts. We are out and about um, on the road um, trying to vaccinate people. We do have an adult vaccine program for uh, people that are underinsured or uninsured. Uh, we have sliding scales available, so we really want to help with that. Um, primary care, different clinics, local pharmacies. And just to highlight, you know, where do we stand with adult vaccine rates? Um, we know overall within the state of Michigan, we are, you know, with, you know, Genesee County is at the lower profile. But um, just to look at pneumococcal vaccine, which we can really help with that infection at ages 65 and above, we're only at about 72% completion rate. And for TD and TDAP, we're only at about the 65% completion rate in our area. We know that if you're not underinsured or um, uninsured, we have the AVP program, but maybe you have a high deductible. So recognizing that there may be some high out-of-pocket costs depending on your insurance plan. And access to vaccines, we also will work with uh, work sites. Mm -hmm. And we plan ahead to have at work sites have uh, vaccine availability. Um, so when we talk about vaccines, our adult vaccines that are available, you know, there's a long list and we'll just touch on some of them right now. But um, I just wanna say with RSV, it's here, it's available. Um, it's something that we want to leverage for our community. Um, and this is really for the first time that this is available. There's two ma manufacturers that are out that are offering them. These are people that are ages 60 years of age and older um, that may be able to get the um, RSV vaccine. Um, and we know that right now it's, it is a one and done vaccine, but as they continue to evaluate that and as uh, immune systems may wane, that will be something that they will be evaluating to see if it's one and done or if it's a more of a seasonal vaccine. Um, they're also researching right now what that means RSV for pregnancy and for infants as well. Those are not um, ready for prime time yet, but there is dialogue that's happening. So for the RSV vaccine for the adult 60 and older, currently adults 65 and up that are on Medicare, only Part D will cover this. And for those 60 and older, it's available for those that have special medical conditions. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you talk about with your provider to see if it is recommended for you to have at 60 and older. The 60 to 64 year old group, um, you know, private, commercial insurance can go to any place that has the RSV vaccine, but the 65 and older can, with only covered with the Medicare Part D, which is pharmacy. Yeah, so go to your pharmacy to get your RSV uh, vaccine. Um, I think it would be difficult to not recognize that we've launched flu vaccines in the community. I think just getting to one place to another, I passed three billboards for different, um, Rite Aid and uh, Walgreens and others saying, you know, flu vaccine is here and it's available. So um, remind everyone that they do need to get their um, vaccine. The, the shot this year targets, you know, the different strains. We look at other territories, other parts of the world to see how to configure that. But it is eligible for everyone six months of age and older. And this is one that, um, I noticed that the CDC is changing their language. They're really trying to educate people that it may not prevent the flu, but it will prevent some of the significant um, comorbidities, complications, hospitalizations that can occur. So I think they're trying to be a little bit more honest and direct with their communication. So someone doesn't come back and say, well, I got my flu shot last year, little did it help me, I still got the flu. Do so I that is question about there. that? Pardon me? I was going to ask, so when, so obviously we're in flu season now, but one of the questions we get from the community and I even get in my office is around when flu season starts, how long the flu vaccine lasts and, and how long flu season lasts for, because we've had these conversations around the vaccine lasting and having coverage. And I think your point about um, really trying to protect against the severity and, and sort of morbidity associated with the flu more than 
preventing the flu is so important because people come to my office or I'm sure Dr. Harris's office or other providers yeah. office and they say, oh, I don't want to get the flu shot because last year I got in it and I still got the flu, right? And we're constantly doing that re-education. So I really, really appreciate that context and wondered if you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I can speak to that. This is Tina. Hey, so Tina. we can barely yeah. see you, just heads up. <laughs> so Wanda, it's a very interesting question. So there really isn't a definitive answer on when flu, flu season begins since COVID. We're not seeing our standard, you know, influenza A that begins around October-ish, you know, and then influenza B around February-ish. We're seeing flu all year round now. So we're still waiting to see if we're going to get back to that norm. But we, I had this discussion actually with the CDC representative um, that is a, contracted with the state on how messaging for flu should be. Because what we're seeing here at the health department, and we speak to community groups and, and we speak to the patients that we see, Flu season traditionally um, and has been provided has been promoted before, beginning from October through March-ish. But we provide vaccine right as soon as we get it, so we can get our VFC vaccine. Generally, we get it at the end of August, and we get our private beginning in September. And we, as healthcare providers, are told to start vaccinating then through the end of June. So. The, the season itself where we see most flu traditionally was from October to March, but we promote flu from end of August through the end of June. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So one of the things we had with CDC is maybe changing that messaging. So maybe why one of the reasons we don't get the uptick of um, the flu vaccine uptake is because we promote it for all year round and people think they can wait and get it at any time. So maybe if we change our messaging a little bit and saying that your, you know, flu um, is is a little bit more uptake a little higher from October through March, you should be getting your, you know, your flu um, at least before the end of October to cover because flu generally covers about six months. Yeah. And so from October, if you get in October, that cover that traditional six month period of high, um, our we receive our highest amount of flu. So if you so if you were to summarize, right, there is sort of a change in when we we have traditionally expected flu to show up and we have Correct. different sort of expectations, but you know, no later than October, the end of October, to get you Correct. published through what has traditionally been our season. Correct. Correct. Yep. That's great. Okay. So we know you're gonna talk about the COVID, the COVID, you know, updates, but um uh, at a later time, but just to note, our Michigan hospitalization rate jumped about 34% this week. Um, we are seeing a spike, and we are seeing that not just in Michigan and Genesee County, but um, throughout the country as well. And there is new variants that are on the rise, um, but the good news is some of the um, symptoms may be more mild, uh, milder, and our, we know our treatment plan has um, improved. But we are um, awaiting um, the new vaccine, um, the new uh, recipe formula that will be out um, for COVID. It is in um, going through the approval process exactly. and um, it got one approval. We'll look at it at the state level. No, exactly. And um, ACIP is the formal name of where it'll be approved and the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services gives it his blessing, and then it'll be available for us in um, Genesee County. So we don't have all the details yet about what, um, go ahead, yeah. I can speak a little bit more on the COVID booster. So the ACIP meets on Tuesday the 12th, and it's predicted that they will pass the current formulation of the monovalent, it'll be a monovalent um, vaccine that'll be coming out. Um, if CDC follows what they have done historically, it'll probably, the CDC director will sign off on that that day and commercialization of the vaccine could begin as soon as the 13th or 14th. So coming soon, yeah. Yes, so really quick, I was hoping you could, you could tell us a little bit about what ACIP is and why people should feel good that the ACIP is doing this work and maybe we are far enough away from our conversations about COVID that I don't know if our team and our people remember the difference between monovalent and bivalent and what that means. So if you could sure. 
briefly yep. explore that. I'll start with ACIP. So ACIP is a governing agency through the CDC that actually looks at all immunizations um, and they decide to accept or to not accept um, any presentation that comes from the pharmaceutical manufacturers vaccine related. Um, and that is the agency that will decide when it's presented on the 12th, they'll look at all the information coming from both manufacturers, um, Pfizer and Moderna and Novavax, um, and, see, and make sure that their research and their studies and their numbers are, look, are what the ACIP looks for to um, go ahead and approve the vaccine. And then the monovalent and bivalent. So the monovalent will be um, an Omicron strain, which will cover from the beginning of the original valent, which was the Delta and the Omicron. So it's um, not too far down the lineage, but close enough so it'll combine those two. And a bivalent would be combining two different lineages of a, of a, a variant. So we're going, the FDA and ACIP are looking at the monovalent with the manufacturers that put together. Um, there'll be three vaccines that will be approved or be looking to be approved on the 12th. It'll be Moderna, Pfizer with their mRNA vaccine, and then it'll be um, Novavax with their traditional um, vaccine. Thank you so much. And we're going to get into the discussion a little bit more about the COVID vaccine and what we can expect with Dr. Harris. Um, I think there's great questions in the chat about how the community is going to respond and where the community can think about getting it. And we will certainly be exploring that a little bit more. Um, certainly want to let you continue. And I just want to let you know that your slides didn't advance, but don't worry. We've been getting the oh. great information that you've been sharing. So keep, feel free if it's not working to just keep Okay, okay. Talking about the information you have. Okay. So the next the vaccine we want to talk about for adult vaccines is the HPV. And the HPV vaccine can actually be given beginning at nine years old, though it's really recommended to start the initiation at 11 or 12 years old. And it go, and we can give the vaccine through the age of 26. Um, some adults 27 through 45 can get the vaccine if they have never been vaccinated with the HPV vaccine before. And H since the HPV vaccines have been out since 2006, we have seen a decrease in cervical precancers um, from the vaccine among teenage girls, infections with HPV types of cancers and genital warts have dropped 88%. Among young adult women, infections with HPV that causes most HPV cancers and genital warts have dropped 81%. And the links in the HPVs that cause um, cervical cancer has dropped 40%. And the HPV vaccine is 100% effective in preventing external genital warts. So it's a really, really important vaccine. Um, some, of the some of the conversations that we hear going to adolescents um, getting the vaccine from their parents is that they don't want their child to get the vaccine because they think it will give them permission to have sex. And some of the some of the messaging that we have found effective is beginning a conversation with HPV about um, this is a vaccine that can help prevent cancer from your child for your child when they do choose to become sexually active. Rather it's you know a year from now or 10 years from now it will help prevent cancer for your child when they do become sexually active. And that seem, that messaging seems to be working a little bit better um, for parents to get their children vaccinated. We still have all, a way to go for the men um, getting their HPV vaccine. They don't seem to, um, for whatever reason, you know, they don't see, the parents don't seem to think their boys need to be vaccinated. We do see a little bit better um, vaccine uptake with, with the females. Um, H, our hepatitis B vaccine is another vaccine adults can get, and that has been, I think it was 1921 or 2021, it was approved that all adults ages 19 through 59 should be vaccinated for their hepatitis B vaccine. Um, and anybody that is 60 and over that maybe have known risk factors for hepatitis B, that maybe do um, IV drug using, um, maybe by work, um, exposure to um, hepatitis B, um, maybe if they travel to places that have more endemic hepatitis B, they should be vaccinated as well. 
Um, and then Tdap are, is another vaccine that adults should be getting. Um, and that's an important vaccine too, because not only does it protect the adult, but it protects the vulnerable um, children and, and babies that we see in the hospitalized with our um, whooping cough pertussis. And the last vaccine we want to talk about is shingles. And shingles is recommended for all adults 50 and over. Um, and you can still get the most current shingles vaccine, Shingrix, if you already had the original shingle vaccine, Zostervax. And Shingrix is 90% effective in preventing shingles and the nerve damage that goes along with shingles. You know, I wanted to, I wondered if you talk a little bit about two things. Um, sure. With Stingrix or Zostavax, I get the question in the office all the time about what happens if I had chicken pox or never had chicken pox. And I wondered mm -hmm. if you discussed that a little bit. So uh, but with getting the vaccine, you can get the vaccine if you have or have not had chicken pox. So it, it doesn't matter. Um, if you have not had chicken pox, you know, it's really important to get the vaccine. But I mean, also if you do have chicken pox because chicken pox, um, I'm sorry, shingles is uh, as a relative of the chicken pox. So it's hard, it's in our system already. If you've had chicken pox, just waiting to come out. It can be brought on by stress. It can be brought on by um, another virus of some sort, but you can get it if you have, have or have not gotten the chicken pox. It is recommended that everybody over 50 get that. Um, it is nasty. I've seen some. It is not a fun diagnosis. In your, in your eyes and, yes. you know, definitely not something that you want to get. It is certainly not something that you want to get. So we hear yes. people, just like you said, say, you know, I've never had chicken pox, so I can't get shingles because there's no virus that'll remain dormant and show up. And so I really appreciate your advice on making sure everyone gets it. Shingles is not fun, people. It's not something it you is, want to experience. It is, and it can, you know, it can come and go for up it to can. a year. You know, you can go away and it can, you know, can reemerge for up to a year. So it is definitely not something you want. It is extremely painful. Right. The last thing I wanted to, to touch base with you on is the Tdap. So Tdap being tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. And you talked about how severe pertussis can be, right? So pertussis being that whooping cough. People don't necessarily realize how severe that can be for children, but also for adults. Yes, yes. we're seeing an increase in the pertussis in adults, you know, as well. So it is very important to make sure that you get your, your Tdap and then continue to get your TD or Tdap every 10 years to protect yourself from, the, from tetanus as well. Yes. So I so tell all the grandparents. Go ahead. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say this is a grandparent one. It, we yes. have so many grandparents that are so confused. Like, well, I'm I'm going to be a new grandparent. Why do I need? I have to get a new vaccine. Well, that's why we want to protect that that newborn that doesn't have Correct. that protection until exactly. they're age eligible to get that. Exactly. Hey. Yeah. I want to thank you all for all of the expertise you've provided. I want to bring Dr. Harris on so she can sort of follow up with you and, you know, talk a little bit about what we can expect with the COVID vaccine. Super appreciate all the support from the health department, all your trusted, incredible information. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for having us. Dr. Harris, talk to a little bit about what we can expect with the COVID vaccine. We've heard a little bit about sort of when we're going to expect the the approvals. I wonder if you would share a little bit about your thoughts on exactly what Dr. G said in the chat. How do we talk to the community about this vaccine that has sort of evolved over time? Um, so I know the question in chat was about the monovalent, bivalent. Um, I haven't dived deeply into kind of those pathways and the, the significant differences between the vaccine. Um, the way I kind of tell people now is that the COVID vaccine and the flu vaccine are in that same kind of um, family as far as something that you're going to need to be getting on a yearly basis. Um, just like the flu vaccine changes every year based on the variants that are happening the year prior, the COVID vaccine is also going to change. And so I do want people to understand that, like, yes, we're talking about all these variants and how we're updating the vaccine, but this is the normal route of a vaccine. And the flu vaccine is probably the mo most relevant and most consistent thing that we see changing on a yearly basis. Um, and so, like I said, the, the monovalent, bivalent kind of status of a, of a vaccine and that impacting someone's trust as far as it changing, I can't really speak on that because all vaccines change on a yearly basis. 
Uh, when it comes to the tr trust aspect, um, it's hard because a lot of children get their vaccines. And just like the um, Joanne was saying, like adults getting vaccines is a difficult um, area for primary care providers, um, pharmacists, like everyone to kind of encourage. And so that trust kind of really dips once you get out of childhood and it's no different just because we're dealing with the COVID vaccine. Um, we really have to reemphasize the high risk individuals or the people who are around or working with high risk individuals on why they should be getting the flu vaccine every year, why they should be getting the COVID vaccine now, which is probably gonna be a yearly thing too, um, to protect themselves from getting worse symptoms, from getting hospitalizations, from um, getting complications that may be ongoing. Um, long COVID continues to be a conversation that we talk about as far as um, not knowing when the symptoms will uh, resolve themselves or what the long-term impact of those symptoms as far as chest pain or difficulty breathing or, or stomach issues, whatever it may be that your COVID virus kind of impacted, those long-term symptoms are still in progress when it comes to research. So we still want people to prevent the infection because we don't know how it will impact them in the present day or how it will impact them in the future. Um, but the, the trust aspect as far as vaccines is an ongoing conversation. Uh, we talked about education, we come to vaccines as far as being a continuous thing. Um, one year, someone's like, yeah, I'll get the, the flu vaccine. And then the, the next year, like, well, I still got the flu. Well, just like the COVID vaccine, you can still get the COVID vaccine and still get COVID. We're just trying to protect people from getting the major complications. I think that's such an important point. And part of what feels important to drive home is that with COVID, we were learning in real time and we still are learning in real time. And I feel like that has been an important part of the education process is as community members, as people in the community, you are watching us learn in real time about what the expectations are about COVID. We're learning monovalent, bivalent, what the vaccine's going to look like now. Realizing that in years past, this is something that we learned, but the community wasn't learning sort of alongside with us, right? And wasn't as privy and available to by virtue of the internet and multiple different sources, sort of mm -hmm. what was going on with vaccine manufacturing. And so we're getting to see in real time the creation, the distribution process, the marketing, the availability of one of the vaccines that keeps us safe. And so the trust aspect, it really feels like I really appreciate this point you made about being a primary care physician in the community is sort of understanding who your trusted resources are, right? It's sort of talking to your local pharmacist, being able to talk to people like you and understand, okay, this is something I'm probably going to have to get yearly. And it's something that's likely to change depending on what the virus is doing this year. And every year it might not be the same, but it's going to be something that's specific and meant to reduce my risk of mm -hmm. severe disease, right? Um, so that's been, that's been super helpful. Any other important points you'd like to share regarding the COVID-19 vaccine that we should be expecting here shortly? Yeah, so um, I mean, over the years, we've learned a lot about COVID. And like you said, everyone's been learning with the medical community. But one of the things that's going to be different this year is the emergency order is over. So all the things that we had access to, we still may have access to, but we also may not have access to because people are not required to give testing or to have access to vaccines. People do not have the grant funding or general funding to spot the cost of vaccines or testing. And so um, one of the questions in the chat was about free testing um, in general. And so I want people to be prepared to have to navigate a little bit more, that it's not gonna be something that's gonna be texted to you, something that's gonna be emailed to you, something that's gonna be on a commercial. Um, pharmacies will probably still have testing and vaccines, but they might not have free testing and vaccines. Um, there's still over-the-counter testing that you can get and pay out of pocket. And there's still insurances that may pay for it, but a lot of the commercial insurances are not required to do anything now. It's just in their good faith that they might be offering the COVID vaccine and might be offering the COVID testing, but there may be co-pays that have to go with that or, or co-insurances have to go with that. And so um, unless you are, Medicare is covering everything um, and depending on the different parts that you have, but as you get out of the government-based insurances is really dependent on what your policy says. And so the, the free for all, uh, free vaccines, free testing, um, people may still do that, but people also may not. Um, and so the, the likely chance of it being completely paid for 
um, if you don't have insurance, is really dependent on where you may go to access those. Um, and so you might have to be a person who's waiting for an announcement from some clinic or some center or the health department to say, hey, we're doing free this or that, free testing, free vaccines on this day. And that might be your opportunity because it may not come around as uh, plentiful as it did last year. Um, because I think the emergency order ended in May. Um, and so Medicaid re-enrollment restarted, um, COVID vaccine and testing policies changed for insurance companies, um, COVID vaccine and testing policies changed for probably people's employers because when you're emergency order, you have a lot of different re regulations versus regular life. And so um, people may be mandating things really or not mandating at all. And so I really want people to be prepared in this season as the respiratory symptoms and COVID-like symptoms and flu-like symptoms present themselves everything that was happening last September or last October, last winter um, may be different now because people aren't required to have the same policies and regulations. Absolutely, absolutely. I wanna give an opportunity for Nurse T and Dr. G to ask their question. Thank you for that wonderful explanation about uh, the bivalent. Uh, most people wanna know what like, bivalent is. It's basically with the, the original uh, virus in the vaccine and EA. Five EA4. That's what the bivalent was. So now we're moving to the monovalent again, which will be probably Idris or EG5 and Parola. It will have more protection against the current uh, variant that's out. So that was a great explanation of how vaccinations change. And Nurse C also had a. Oh, I was just going to say when we're um, educating and we're communicating with the community, we're really going to have to stress the difference because the community will think that we're going to a lesser strength of vaccination because we took them from mono to buy and now we're going to take them from buy back to mono so we're really going to have to be critical in how we address the community how we build the community up because this will create another hesitancy to get this dose of vaccination because a lot of times we constantly change and, and us as healthcare providers we know why but the community don't, and they already sometimes think that we're using them as guinea pigs. So just making sure all our messaging and that we're clear and explaining um, why the changes and how it's gonna be beneficial um, to them. I think that's an exceptional point that sometimes gets overlooked that we're providing some information about the vaccine and that people essentially what you're saying is people are paying attention, right? And mm -hmm. people are paying attention and they're asking questions about, is this good coverage? Is this something that's really going to protect me? Is this another example where someone has tried to give me something that is not as providing the best protection that I can receive? And I think the context about we have vaccines that are that change, we have a vaccine this year that is intended to provide more protection against the dominant strains that are around this year and it's monovalent because there is a more prevalent strain feels really important to make sure that we're articulating to the community. I really appreciate that point. Thanks Nurse T and Dr. G. Dr. Harris, any last points before we talk a little bit about food systems in Flint or Nurse T and Dr. G? Um, I guess my final comment would be because the new one is coming out um, so soon as far as later this month um, I definitely encourage people if you were kind of going to think about doing it at the beginning of September just wait a couple weeks and get the the stronger version um, because that'll be more effective and will cover you um, better for the rest of the season now if you're really in a jam you're like I got to get it now or I'm not going to get it later um, I definitely recommend just getting the COVID vaccine in general um, but if you can waiting till the new one comes out will be very helpful and so it sounds like it, incorporating a little bit about what Nurse T just said, right? It would be a little bit like getting last year's flu shot to cover this year's flu season, right? You want to get the, the COVID vaccine that's central to what's likely to be out there circulating around our area and during this time. Yeah, and we've had, I mean, I don't know if people have noticed, but we've had, when they mentioned the 30% increase, there's been an increase in COVID infections. Mm -hmm. People are a little bit more aware of like the symptoms and a little bit more prone to get testing now because we've been in this, this world for the last few years. Um, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that kids return to school. 
Um, they all came from these different households. They're no longer doing the online. Well, some of them are doing online, but most of them are in school. And so that's going to really change the direction of this season. Um, unlike last year, where there was kind of people in school, but not everybody was in school. This year, majority of students are in school. And we love for students to get great educations, but they're all next to each other. Um, you know, when we work places, we aren't, we don't have that big of a workplace, but schools are huge um, clusters of different households and different germs, no matter how clean people are. So I really want people to be aware that we may see a different wave this year because people are all together um, because of the students. Listen, I blame my kids for the one time I got sick because of COVID. So I, I, I totally buy that. Mm -hmm. They went to school and brought it home to me. It's all their fault. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Super appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, Nurse T. Super appreciate you. You're welcome. You. Dr. G, I see you in the background. We're going to get into Flint Leverage Points Project. So we're going to be talking a little bit our, about our food systems in Flint. And uh, I'm so excited to have Chelsea Wentworth and I see Kelly McClelland here from MSU Extension to talk a little bit about this project. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And thanks for this great conversation earlier about the COVID vaccines. It's so helpful. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and I have a few slides uh, for you all. Is that working? Are you yeah. able to see yeah. that? Your Perfect. Slide. Perfect. Great. So um, I'm going to go through this really briefly. And one of the things that I really want to emphasize and stress in, in the, our conversation today is that we have a pretty cool website where all this information is located. And so um, I would strongly encourage everyone to take a few minutes to go and explore our website and to talk to us more because there's really a lot to unpack here. And you don't have to take it all in at once. We're happy to work with you and make sure that you um, can access information going forward. So the Flint Leverage Points Project um, was a five-year partnership that between um, our partners at the Community Foundation of Greater Flint and Michigan State University to better understand the food system in Flint. And we think about that food system really broadly from production and growing to distribution and access consumption, you know, eating, my favorite part, um, and then food waste. So we were thinking about this really broadly and really systemically. And we also had a community consultative panel, which is really essential to how we approached our work, where we um, partnered with faith leaders and activists and folks who work in the, for the city and then government and a bunch of leaders from nonprofit organizations and the food bank um, that are working to improve food access for Flint residents. So bringing all of those folks together to really help drive and direct the research on this project, and then ultimately making sure that we're providing and, and creating something that's useful to people as a whole. And so we're, we're done with the research part and we're interested in sharing this out and making sure that this is available to everyone. Um, and Kelly is gonna talk a little bit in a, in a minute or so about what we're doing to help, um, you know, what, 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 might, what it might look like to use some of this research. Um, but I also wanna mention Kelly right now because she also served on our community consultative panel. So um, on our website, which is uh, www.canr.msu.edu slash Flint food, you can see um, and on the landing page, you'll get a big um, a little video that you can watch that kind of provides an overview. Um, but I really want to point out this tab here for resources and publications. And this is the tab where you will find all of the results related to our project. So you can see on this sidebar, we've got policy briefing notes. We created tools that community members can use to kind of continue on using some of this work. Um, we did a timeline of, of the history of the Flint food system. We did a lot of work to collect um, values of, that community members held about the food system, what they want, what they like about the food system now, and what they want to see in the future food system. Um, we looked at uh, grocery and transportation networks, and we did a scenarios workshop. So there's just tons and tons of data here on all of these 
um, different parts. So please take some time to visit our website, um, click on this resources and publications tab and explore some of the data that we have here. Um, and as you, if you enter this for the first time and you're new to our project, I would recommend starting um, here at the key lessons where we're kind of trying to synthesize some of the results. And I'm gonna show you two of the things that you'll see there. So we, we created four different um, graphic summaries of some of the big findings that we had. Um, this is what one of them looks like. And we, um, based on, on community feedback, we have four kind of key ways that people are describing what the food system looks like currently and what they hope it will look like in the future. So this one is focused on community collaborative action with the goal of having this desirable future where community service providers collaborate with resource providers and governments, nonprofits, residents and faith-based organizations and retailers for everyone's mutual benefit and really working towards achieving authentic community-based collaboration across all sectors. So that was one of the um, values that people really wanted to have and how, how they saw kind of unsiloing some of the work that's happening in the food system now. On the middle, you'll see some example leverage points. And leverage points are places within a system where you can take some relatively small actions that will lead to some really big changes. And so we also identified leverage points as part of this project, and we highlight just some of them on these graphics. On our website, you can get full lists of all the leverage points that we came up with um, as well. So this is just kind of some ways and ideas that people came up with um, to help uh, move us as a community towards this desirable future. And um, as, again, there are four of these. I'm just going to show you two. Um, one of them, the another one is on economic investment. And so here we're really talking about how um, we want in a desirable future and what residents want in a desirable future is to really draw on the strengths and assets within our community um, and that future economic investment results in Flint-based ownership within the food system so that economic de development can foster cultural growth and it's culturally appropriate and can improve the quality of life for all residents. Um, and because both the purchasing and production and growing of food, but also new ways of distribution innovations there um, and making sure that we can get, um, get food to people is um, really an economic process. And we wanna kind of emphasize the role that um, economic investment can have in the food system can have in really improving um, both food access and broader quality of life. So again, we have these um, example leverage points or examples of kind of smaller um, uh, actions that people could take that could have a really big shift and change in how the food system functions as a whole. And we have more um, ideas and actions to work around um, on our website. So these, this is just two, there are four of these, um, and this might be a good place, I think, to kind of enter into learning a bit more about um, the types of work that we did um, and what some of these kind of desirable future outcomes are. And then you can kind of go through and think um, a bit more about some of these other tools and briefing notes and um, looking at some of the results of our photo project and things like that, where you can kind of delve into uh, the data and the results a little bit more, uh, a little bit deeper. So again, um, you can find all of this at www.canr.msu.edu slash Flint Food, and um, click on that resources and publications tab to find all of those um, materials. And I want to give um, Kelly some time to talk about 
what is happening with some of this, the work that we've we've done. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Chelsea mentioned before, I was a part of the community consultative panel um, through a few different roles I had within uh, food and nutrition uh, work in Flint over the past four years. And now I'm a community food systems educator with MSU Extension. And my whole job really is to support a solid food system that gets food to people um, and make sure that people are connected with where their food comes from. So one thing that I really use the products from the Leverage Point process, a project for is kind of checking myself and my work to make sure is what I'm focusing on aligning with the values that, you know, Chelsea and her team, uh, you know, learned from Flint residents were what a desired food system would be in Flint, you know, and is my work aligning with the different leverage points um, that are opportunities to really shift towards those changes. Um, so, you know, this project really informs all the work that I do, but one specific project that I really want to point out um, here today and invite all of you, if you're not already connected with us, um, to, to be a part of or, or give your input on is the Flint and Genesee Food Policy Council. So kind of and currently kind of parallel to the Leverage Points project um, through some funding and support that the Crim Fitness Foundation um, was able to have, the Flint and Genesee Food Policy Council really kind of got some feet under it in the past two years or so. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Food Policy Council, generally it's a group of, you know, geographically specific people. So in our case, we're focusing on Genesee County um, and people focused on the food system broadly. So from the nutrition side of things, emergency food, food production, food waste, um, all different aspects of the food system, and really focusing on policies, whether that's the federal policy, like the farm bill that we talked about in our uh, food policy council meeting last month, or even kind of less formal policies, like what's a school's purchasing policy for local food, things like that. Um, so we come together, we talk about these things, and then we create a series of recommendations. Um, so what you're seeing on your screen now is some info from our website. Again, it's a very basic website because we're just starting all of this and we need your help. Um, so our web address is flintfoodcouncil.org. Um, and you will notice that that redirects you back to a page of the Crim Fitness Foundation's website. Um, like I said, they've been really fantastic kind of being our, our anchor organization um, as this is kind of beginning. Eventually, maybe we'll have our own website or our own page. Um, but right now, all the info of how to connect with the Food Policy Council can be found there. So flintfoodcouncil.org. We meet on the second Thursday of every month right now, monthly meetings with some upcoming other opportunities to engage, maybe some less business meeting, more social opportunities. Um, we meet 3 to 4.30 on that second Thursday, and we're offering both in-person and virtual opportunities to join. So to get on that invite list um, or, or just kind of stay involved with the with what's going on with the Food Policy Council. Um, that red button you see on the slide here on our website, and I'll also put the link in the chat um, once I'm done speaking, is going to take you to this member interest form. Um, and so, you know, if you want to share your email address and, you know, maybe what brings you to food focused work in Genesee County, um, we want to connect with you and you'll get uh, meeting invites and updates and relevant information. Um, and if you sign up on this interest form before about two o'clock today, you'll get the email from me about next week's meeting. So a uh, little incentive to do that quickly. So really, you know, the Food Policy Council is just one way that we as the Flint community are taking the lessons that we've learned from this multi-year Flint Leverage Points project and really turning it into action, turning it into realization of the food system that we all want, you know, when we work or live or play um, here in Flint. So um, definitely I see a ton of familiar names on the, on the list here today and know that there's other work happening in parallel to the Food Policy Council. So definitely invite you to connect with the Policy Council and also continue to engage with the um, products of the Le Leverage Points Project to kind of give you that check and, and make sure we're all on the, on the same track. Thanks. Would you tell us a little bit about like what was the most recent topic at the most recent council? 
Yeah, great question. So the past few meetings, we've been talking about the farm bill. Um, so we had Dondre Young from Senator Stabenow's office kind of come and give us a little overview of what the farm bill is and how it impacts us here in Flint and Michigan as a whole and then the country. Um, and then we've been working on, you know, kind of synthesizing some recommendations or priorities um, from the council for this upcoming farm bill, you know, as they're really battling it out in Washington to figure out what's going to be in this piece of legislation. Um, so that's kind of the most formal policy topic that we have have had so far, honestly. Um, some meetings have been really focused on process since we are figuring out, you know, how do we say we put our name behind this? We're, we're figuring those systems out. Um, election of voting members and officers. And I should mention um, that we have three co-chairs of this group. Um, so it's Sam Farah from the Krim Fitness Foundation, Athena McKay, and Tony Vu. So kind of people from different aspects of the food system are really shaping what this group focuses on. It feels like such an important and essential way to get involved in the policy implications of, of what happens with food and Flint just across the board, which is really cool. I'm like, I'm having this idea about having my students get involved because it feels so important and they're always looking for opportunities to sort of engage and have some real policy implications. So really appreciate you sharing about that. Yeah. And you, point to both. Uh, oh, go for it, Harold. I have a question. Do you work with uh, food rescue programs? You know, I'm not sure if we have anyone currently involved who is a part of a food rescue program, but we definitely would love to connect with some. Okay. Uh, you, you can count on me then. Fantastic. Fantastic. If you're able, would you fill out that interest form? Um, otherwise, I'll note to follow up with you after. Um, this is amazing. Contact what a um, MCCLE 100 at MSU. Is that the best way to reach you or? Yeah, so that's my direct uh, email. If it's something very specific to the Food Policy Council, that Flint Food Council at Gmail address that's up right now. Um, I also check that one because, <laughs> um, and so do our other co chairs of the of the Food Policy Council. So either one will work. Okay. Oh my gosh, I feel like we just made a community connection live. I feel so great about this. This is so neat. Thank you, Harold, for speaking up. And thank you, Chelsea. This is awesome. Sure. I wonder if you all have any last questions, comments uh, before we, we let you go and talk about the last few events that are going to be happening in Flint before our one o'clock. No. Okay, that's... Well, I'm really happy that Heather Lynn, um, she also put some uh, stuff in the chat, the, the links to the Food Policy Council, to the form where you can sign up to get more information about the Food Policy Council, um, and to our um, Flint Leverage Points project website. So all of that is um, is there for you to check on and, and learn more. Um, and we're like, the, the work that Kelly is doing with her colleagues in the Food Policy Council is so fantastic. And it's really um it it's really the the goal of our research is to be able to produce something that people can use. Um, and so if you have other ideas, please feel free to contact me as well um, because we want to make sure that all of this is out there and usable and accessible to everyone. So we're um we're more than happy to help make sure that that's that's available. Um, so I have one last thing. Um, I let's see if my there we go. Um, so I am also one of the co-directors for the um, Healthy Flint uh, Research Coordinating Council, and every year at the end of September, they have a research symposium, and it is a great opportunity to come and learn about research that's happening around Flint that's related to health. Um, there are it's very uh, diverse audience. Everything is presented to um, a community, to, uh, to a community audience. So we want people, this is not like an academic conference type thing. This is about making sure that everyone has access to research results. Um, 
about work that's happening in Flint. So um, we do need you to register. You can go to www.hfrcc.org um, and you can click on the events um, tab to get to the registration page. Um, it will look like this and you can click this blue register here button. And um, the, the symposium is September 29th from 9.30 to three. It's free to register and you do get lunch. So we do need people to register so that you can, we can have enough food for everyone. <laughs> um, but, but come, we have a great um, lineup of, of presenters. Um, there'll be poster presentations and oral presentations and lots of opportunities for networking. So it'll be pretty great. So we hope you'll be able to join us. Thank you so much, Chelsea. I wanted to also mention that Dr. G said in the chat that they're um, still doing pop-up cl clinics for vaccines. So just shout out to Dr. G. Shout out to Harold for volunteering live. I that's just super cool, super dope. Um, back to school health games for Flint and Genesee County. Registration is open. You see the information there. Great event. That's Saturday, September 29th. September 9th. And we have the MSUCHM teddy bear picnic. My students, my peds interested students are going to be doing the vaccines 11 a.m. to 2. I'm going to try to pull through. Um, and it's a great event. It happens every year. Actually, my kids stole one of the teddy bears. So I got to go and get some and put one back because they're hanging out in our FJV building. So we'll be getting more teddy bears for that. Check out the Herc. And thank you so much to everyone. We'll see you next week.